from So Say We All and KPBS in San Diego, welcome to Incoming, the series that features true stories from the lives of America's veterans, told in their own words, straight from their own mouths. I'm your host, Justin Hudnall. We have two of the most entertaining, self-made, grunt-ass Marines I know on today's show for you, and they really couldn't be more different from each other, except both of their upbringings made them perfect candidates for the United States Marine Corps, the USMC an acronym Marines will often repurpose when referring to themselves as Uncle Sam's misguided children. A lot of what happens on our show, intentionally or otherwise, takes aim at stereotypes that have been assigned to service members, and it is a stereotype indeed that people enlist in the military because there's just nothing else they could have done with their lives, that it is an act born of desperation. And I know that's a concept hanging out there for some, consciously or otherwise, because I've heard it said and seen it written too many times. But it is important to interrogate the role that class plays in our military's recruitment. And because of our friends at the Pew Research Center and the survey they conducted about it back in 2011, we know that when the economy tanks, military enlistment does go up. I believe that was true way back in 2002, long before I had any empirical evidence to back it up. And I believed our military knew it then too, because I was living in a very low income, way out there Brooklyn neighborhood after 9-11. And I remember seeing the recruiters swarming the blocks after. Pew also found that the post 9-11 GI Bill was a huge incentive driving enlistment during Iraq and Afghanistan, but this is the military people. It's not a part-time job down at the Piggly Wiggly, and I promise the pay is not that great. There are other jobs people could do for money that do not involve going to a war zone and additional reasons for why the people who did chose to do so. 90% of the veterans and service members Pew surveyed said their motivation to join was primarily because they legitimately wanted to serve their country. 70% liked the educational benefits that came on top of that. 60% were inspired to see more of the world. 57% wanted to learn unique skills and only 27% reported they were partially motivated to join because they had problems finding civilian jobs. The reason I bring all this up and inflict a statistics lesson on you is because of how easy it is for an individual to get lost among all of those numbers and assumptions. And our first guest on today's program wrote and performed a true story for you about exactly that. So let me introduce you to Brian Simpson. I met Brian when I was leaving a bar back in 2011 and found him outside, hitting on my girlfriend at the time. But he was so hilarious, so quick with his mind and his mouth that we ended up becoming friends. And that same night, I told him he should really look into getting into stand-up comedy. Seven years later, he's just been made a paid regular at the Los Angeles Comedy Store with his name on the wall alongside Ali Wong's, Whoopi Goldberg's, Steve Martin's, Gary Shandling's, and the list goes on. So here's Brian performing his original story, A Breath of Fresh Air, live at the So Say We All Vamp Storytelling Showcase at the Whistle Stop Bar in San Diego, California. I'm the opposite of Justin in every way. I'm short, I'm black, and I have no problem begging for money. (laughs) Give me a dollar, motherfuckers. All right. We let the minority say the first curse word of the night. All right, here we go. Uh, A breath of fresh air. I hate gas masks. It was pretty early into my first 18 years spent shuttled between five of Maryland's foster and group homes that I understood what it meant to be seen as a number instead of a human being. It motivated the biggest decision of my life to date. If I was just going to be another number, there should at least be some purpose behind it. So I joined the Marine Corps. And for all of this testosterone, it was the least violent and most stable environment I'd known. The Marine Corps gave me my first opportunity to be around white people who weren't in a position of authority. No social workers, no cops, just ordinary people like me. A lot of whom unintentionally helped me realize I wasn't nearly as dumb as I'd grown up thinking I was, at least by comparison. Upon completion of boot camp, I was all in. The Corps was a place where nobody could become somebody. A meritocracy where the smart, fast, and strong rose to the top. No worthless tests that lacked obvious relevance to your life. 
This was going to be the beginning of my climb to the top. I loved the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps loved me. My first time in the Middle East was March of 2003 and began somewhere in the middle of Kuwait. At the time, no one was sure if we were actually going to invade Iraq or not. No other group of people debated the topic more heavily than the Marines of Max 1 EWC. No Marine in the EWC debated the topic more heavily than Lance Corporal Simpson. That's me, who has several hundred bucks riding on the issue. <laughs> the EWC stands for Early Warning and Control. Our job was to man an awesome state-of-the-art radar system that could see some classified distance away. The first to detect planes and missiles launched by an enemy. My personal responsibility was to maintain an advanced radar interface. Most of the stuff never breaks, so most of the time was spent playing spades and board games. Our mandate was to assume that any missile that was launched contained some sort of biological weapon and to alert the entire camp right away. Of course, none of this really mattered to me at the time because we weren't actually at war with anyone yet, and as I mentioned before, I had several hundred bucks riding on the issue. <laughs> every single day of every single week for the two months we've been in country, we had biological weapon drills five to seven times a day to prepare for the very likely scenario that we were attacked by a biological weapon, contingent upon the very unlikely scenario that we would actually go to war. By now, I've been in the Marine Corps long enough to find nothing strange about preparing for a threat that was either unlikely, outdated, or completely non-existent. This is the military way of life. <laughs> the, <ne> the means <laughs> by which it justifies its outrageous budget and ego. By week three, we had so many drills that we'd broken our military-issued nuclear, biological, and chemical alarm and had to use a modified seven-ton truck horn in its place through a jury rig process involving high voltage cabling, an industrial generator, and Satan. <laughs> the result was a noise that sounded like the opening ceremony of the apocalypse, or as I like to imagine it, an elephant if you were to set its nuts on fire and roll it down a bumpy hill. When you heard the alarm, you had to stop what you were doing, scream, gas, 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 while you were finding and putting on your mask and hazmat suit, then running to the nearest trench or bunker and waiting to be given the all clear. Wearing a gas mask when it's 90 degrees outside with 0% humidity is comparable to putting a condom on your face and then manning a barbecue grill. Being made to do so countless times for what always ended up being a drill resulted in almost everyone becoming complacent long before we created the old truck horn. We'd be sitting in the bunker playing cards, joking around, hating life, when someone mumbling obscenities through their carbon filters. And because you had to stop and run to the closest bunker to you, the people you ended up in the bunker with were often totally random. At times, I found a bunker that contained only my friends. And on one of these occasions, I decided it would be a good idea to cheat, loosen my straps, and put my headphones in. <laughs> it turned out that my lieutenant looked a lot like my buddy Tom when he had a gas mask. On. <laughs> the lieutenant was clearly not pleased with my music listening. It could have been me, or it could have been that he didn't feel that 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying was a classic. <laughs> but either way, my punishment was to make a 1 to 100 scale replica of the Great Wall of China out of sandbags. Sandbags that I had to fill while wearing my gas mask. Again, I hate gas masks. I won't even smoke weed out of them. On March 17, 2003, I'd been in Kuwait for a couple of months. I found myself fresh off my shift and right in the middle of a heated game of Trivial Pursuit. I don't remember anything else about the night except the card I drew. The question on the card was, in 1996, the US military tested all their gas masks for defects. 
what percentage were found to be defective? <laughs> I lost the game because I guessed 10%. The answer was 50. 50%. <laughs> I reflected on all those trust building exercises that we'd done before we left. They showed us a video of a goat being vaporized by a gas that Saddam was most assuredly in possession of. When we were still in America, we'd all went to the gas chamber to test our equipment against tear gas. Since we were assigned specific indiv individual masks, the exercise was supposed to help us build confidence in our equipment. But because we ended up being a few masks short at the gas chamber, a handful of Marines in my platoon, myself included, ended up not even being able to test the mask that we would ultimately end up deploying with. I told every single Marine I passed on the way back to my tent that night, hey, did you know that your gas mask might not work? <laughs> it's a 50-50 shot. <laughs> they made us do all those drills, and that damn thing doesn't even work. 50 f***ing percent of the time. <laughs> I was like a manic Paul Revere running through Tent City. <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. We're nothing but a number to them. Agent Orange in Vietnam, LSD in World War II, Gulf War Syndrome, and now this. I mean, if the people that made Trivial Pursuit knew about this, <laughs> then how the hell could the military not? <laughs> Unless they did. I had my whole situation pegged all wrong. The military isn't a race to the top. It's a struggle to stay in the middle, a contest to see how far the system can fail before it's forced to admit that it needs change. Here I was trying so desperately to escape the fate of staying a nobody, I didn't see the alternative I'd chosen. In the Marine Corps, you're not nobody, you're anybody. You're just another cog of the machine, replaceable, expendable, a number on some colonel's spreadsheet. No one took my rants seriously because not only had we grown complacent about the NBC drills, we'd also grown complacent about the possibility of going to war with Iraq. I was putting my revolutionary complex on full display out of outrage, but not fear. Because the truth was, I slept like a baby, confident that what I learned about my gas mask would never matter because it would never be tested. Never bet against a bush going to war. The very next morning, we woke up, were called into formation, and informed that the war had already started in the middle of the night. From this moment forward, there will be no more drills. Any alarm sounded is the real deal. Almost immediately after we were dismissed, just as I was starting to think about all the money I lost on that stupid bet, the alarm sounded. In an instant, the complacency of the past few months was exposed as suicidal behavior. All the Marines moved like madmen, scrambling to get the little bits and pieces of equipment we come to take for granted, trying desperately to remember all the procedures that might save our lives. So now I find myself sitting in a ditch, in the desert, facing death with a good portion of the people I care about all around me, and all I can think about is that damn trivial pursuit card in that damn goat. I can't stop visualizing how the goat evaporated its skin falling to the ground like there were no bones or organs inside. I can hear the instructor's voice so clearly describing the symptoms of being infected by this gas. I'm not imagining this. It's happening to me. I'm dying. These pools of sweat building up around the rubber seals on my forehead, my cheeks, and on the back of my neck will start to burn at any moment right before I lose control of my bowels and my soul and evaporate into nothing like the victim of some Mortal Kombat finishing move. I fear for my life before, but I always believed that I could at least affect the situation in some way. Now I'm at the mercy of the numbers. It all comes down to two coin flips. 50-50 chance the incoming missile contains bioweapons and a 50-50 chance that my mask will work if it did. I'm supremely aware of every single sensation, every single nerve ending in my body was vying for my attention, 
while my mind disassociated. I scanned the trench lined with almost smugness, thinking to myself, these poor bastards don't even know how close we are to death right now, so confident in their protection. I'm slowly losing my mind here. I'm imagining how awesome it would be to not be about to die. What I would do for just one more breath of fresh air. It would feel like being born again. I want that breath of fresh air so bad, I couldn't stand it. The feel of the cool breeze on my face and the refreshing, non-poisonous air filling up my lungs. Like being released from a hostage situation into a sauna and afterwards running right into a walk-in freezer made of valerian steel and York peppermint patties. <laughs> I've already made my mind up. I'd rather go out like Private Powell than that f***ing goat. I click my M16 from safe to unsafe. I put the business end under my chin, put my finger on the trigger, and wait for the gas to affect my nervous system and the resulting twitch to finally make me literally the no one I'd never wanted to be. And that's when I heard the two sweetest words in the English language echo from the distance. All clear! All clear! All clear. All right, Brian Simpson, welcome to Incoming. You mentioned in your piece that you grew up partially in the foster care system out on the East Coast. Do you think that that made it easier or was more natural when you transitioned from one system to another when you joined the Marine Corps? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't know, because when I, when I was a foster kid, I don't know if I was, if I was really as aware of, or as conscious of being in a system as when you join the Marine Corps, and it's sort of like a parent that's always in your face that it's a system and that everything is regimented, you know? In, in the foster care thing, it's sort of a, you only get glimpses of the system in between pretending like you're a regular kid and, and a regular fan, you know? And then when you're plucked out of a home and then you have a court date, you know, or think something like that, then you're aware and then you're back to this uh, illusion of normalcy, whereas the, the military doesn't give you any sort of illusion. You're just in the machine, you know? Did you find that kind of, like, consistency that the Marine Corps demanded was um, appealing in any way? I don't know if that's the right word to use with that kind of discipline. But Yeah, well, I mean, I think at the time I didn't, I didn't find it appealing. But looking back on it, I think it was good for me for sure. Yeah. You know, no one can get rid of you. you know, I mean, unless you do something really horrible. But um, I, don't, I don't know very many people that, that, that that sort of thing happened to. What was it like going from one system to another and then finally being in no system once you were out of the core? Was it like a system shock at all? Yeah, I think that, that's a hard adjustment. And I think it's still hard, actually. I mean, I think it's hard for a lot of veterans, especially the ones that really wanted to get out. <laughs> and then you get out and you realize, oh, like, I miss that. I miss it sometimes, yeah, for sure. But I would also never go back in. <laughs> but if I could go back to being young and go back in, I would do. I would stay in, but I wouldn't go back in now. When you transferred out here to Miramar, what were some of the things that really surprised you when you landed on the West Coast? Oh, just how awesome it was. Just the weather was immediately... I mean, when I got here, it was the 6th or 7th of July or something like that, and it was just a perfect day. It was perfect. You know, it had like a, a perfect breeze. It was like 73 degrees or something. And I walk up and my roommate's just sitting outside with like a pitcher of lemonade or something. And I was just like, oh yeah, I could do this. One of the lines in your piece mentions how when you moved out to Miramar, when you joined the Corps, it was the first time you were around white people who weren't in a position of authority over you. No police officers, no social workers, no nothing. Just guys like you who sometimes you outranked or really quickly outranked. I know the military and the Marine Corps doesn't acknowledge race they like to call black people dark green Marines. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know if they still do that, but that, that, yeah, they surely did that when I was in it. But what was it like being one of the few African-American soldiers? No, no I was the only. <laughs> I was the only black person in my, in my platoon for a long time. What was that like coming from a predominantly African-American neighborhood? It was kind of a culture shock. 
um, I think I found myself in the position of constantly trying to make white people comfortable. It really made me aware of a lot of racial disparities and mis and misunderstandings and that sort of thing. But no one, I don't think anyone like outright hated me, but it was like, I didn't have a word for microaggressions at the time, but it was just a lot of that, you know, a lot of like, hey, do you realize how racist that is? It was a lot of situations like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, I guess you were probably the first black friend to a lot of white guys. Oh, yeah. I mean, but, you know, I, w- I was doing the same thing. I mean, it w- there were a lot of assumptions that I made about white people that I had to realize that, like, you have to treat everyone you know, you know, give everyone an equal chance to show you who they are instead of assuming you know who they are. But it was much easier for me to learn that than I think it was for uh, for a lot of the white people. You know, because I think what I got out of the experience is, is that, like, you know, you have to give everybody a, a shot. But I think what a lot of them got out of the situation was that w- their assumptions about black people were still correct and that I was some sort of exception to the rule. Mm. You know, that's just how it went. But, you know, and... and I don't think it really ultimately mattered. I mean, because everyone that mattered still sh- showed me love, you know, and they would still do anything for me. But I still don't know how they feel about black people in general. Talk to me a little bit about the friendships you made while you were in the Corps. I mean, you're still tight with a couple of your guys out here in San Diego. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of guys that aren't here in San Diego. but yeah, And they're, and they're all white guys, mostly. <laughs> you know, it, it's weird for me because I think that when you're in the Marine Corps, when you're in the military period, I think it's one of those jobs that's also a lifestyle, you know, like being a cop or being a musician or something like that. You know, it's your whole life is that thing. And so you have your whole life in common with all these people around you. But that's like a false, That's it's not real, you know, because once you're out, you know, you're back to being a kid from D.C., and they're back to being like, you know, a redneck from Texas. And it's like, you have nothing in common. You can go from having everything in common to having nothing in common. Um, you know, it's like, I'm bleeding heart liberal, and most of them are Republicans or, you know, Donald Trump supporters or whatever. And it's like, yeah, we disagree on pretty much everything, but we would still do anything for each other. You know, it's kind of weird like that. It's like you took an oath, but you really didn't, you know? But something still persists, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's something about taking a uh, taking a dump back to back with somebody in the middle of the desert that you know you sort of all the <laughs> all the unimportant things sort of fade to the background. Yeah, that's a unique bonding experience. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. So now that you're back in San Diego, um, you become a stand up comedian, arguably one of the best stand up comics we got in San Diego, if anything, maybe nothing at all. But what do you grab from your experience as a soldier when you're writing your material and going on stage? Is there any overlap or carry over there? Oh, yeah. The Marine Corps turned me into a comedian, for sure. The uh, learning when to speak, the timing thing, like learning that you could get away with saying all those things that people think and don't ever say because it's not appropriate. I learned in the Marine Corps that you could get away with saying them if you say them at the right time, you know. I also learned that if you say some of those things at the, at the perfect time, that it's funny. You know, if you say them at the wrong time, then you get groans. If you say them at the perfect time, it's hilarious. I didn't, like, dream of being a comedian at the time, but I just got into those habits, you know, and it definitely helps me now. Yeah, you you said once that you started becoming a comic when you were in the military before you even knew that that's what you were doing. Right, yeah. You know, sure. What was that instinct to make light? I mean, did you feel like it was a way of lightening the situation or blowing off pressure? Like, what was the... Oh, need? yeah, for sure, because uh, because I, the first inappropriate thing I started making fun of was race. It was the first thing, and I think a lot of military people end up doing that, <laughs> but... But it was just that my in my unique situation, just I, I ended up in a unit. The reason I was the only black person in my unit is because there had been some kind of racial incident in the unit before I came that I didn't know about. And when I first got to the unit, I was picked out of the school. I was, I was the only black person in my class. And I was picked to go to San Diego, which is the best place to go, only because they needed a black person there, you know. And I didn't know any of this until way later somebody accused the captain of being racist or something like that and and uh he got moved to another unit and they brought me in to sort of you know i wasn't like a spy or nothing like that but i guess when i they didn't know that you know so they everybody was acting so very uh politically correct like i could just tell i could just feel that 
people were like walking on eggshells around me, like just being real careful about what they're saying and rewording what they mean. And, and, and it was just making me uncomfortable. So I decided that I would start this saying inappropriate things, you know. Once somebody pulled me to the side and explained to me like why everybody was acting so weird, then I decided, okay, well, I don't care. If you can say whatever you want to say, but I'm going to say what I want to say. You know, and then so I sort of got this leeway to say whatever I wanted to say. And that kind of, you know, there was a lot of times where I should have been in trouble, but because of those unique circumstances, I, it was nothing, you know. It was just like, oh, well, that's just Simpson running his mouth. Well, let me flip my earlier question around. Do you think being a comedian helped or hurt your career as a soldier? Well, I mean, I wasn't a comedian at the time. Well, you know, like the prototype of what would oh. become a stand-up comic, you know, that comic instinct. Oh, yeah. When it was me and when it was me and my platoon, it it didn't affect it one way or the other. But whenever we encountered some bigger bureaucracy, like whenever we were had to be around our parent unit, or when I was sent to some other place where you know it was sort of more strict, yeah, I probably got in a lot of more trouble than I, I mean. But but I never got in any official trouble. My name would end up on this list of people that had to go you know burn feces, or I would end up on the post that had to be by the trash pit where they were burning garbage and i knew that it was because i said some smart remark to the wrong person but but it was never official you know i would just get some talking to like hey hey simpson you need to watch who you talking to and make sure you're looking at people's ranks in the dark and i would think everything was okay and then i would end up on some party to go do some undesirable task but that was worth it <laughs> We're back with our guest, Marine Corps veteran and stand-up comedian, Brian Simpson, talking about maintaining identity while serving in the armed forces. When you decided to, um, to transition out of the military, what was the most helpful thing you did to kind of adapt back to civilian life? I started doing stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like you, cre you recreated a new kind of brotherhood there to replace the one you... No, no, not at all. No, because I'm still closest with the people from the Marine Corps, but um, but I regained purpose. Because you used to have a purpose every morning. You would get up and know exactly what you were doing and, and why it mattered. And then, and, and that's just sort of gone. And then, and then when I started doing stand-up, it's like now I have, I have that. Like, I know exactly what my goal is every day. And I know exactly why. I'm doing those things, you know. If I just had to work a regular job and I didn't have stand-up, I would have blown my brains out a long time ago. Maybe maybe blow my brains out is a little not, because that's not how I would do it. <laughs> you put thought into it. I mean, honestly, <laughs> well, that's a whole other conversation. But, yeah, I put a lot of thought into it. But I don't. I haven't thought of a way that I'd be comfortable with. I don't have a car, so I can't do the whole, like, lock myself in the garage thing with the silent and just fall asleep with the... Exo you know, I can't do that. What was the period that was darkest for you between becoming a stand-up comic and leaving the Corps? <sighs> hmm. There was like a period there. I got out and went to, I moved to Oregon. When I tried to go to school, and it was just like running into this. Civilian bureaucracies are a thousand times more frustrating than military bureaucracies, you know? Because there's more nuance. It's like in the military, if you're not getting paid, someone is in trouble. You know, and you know exactly who that someone is. There's like a chain of command. You know exactly who to go talk to, and it's and the problem is going to get worked out. And in the meantime, you don't have to worry about your rent and all that other stuff. But it's like in the civilian world, it's like if you don't get your paycheck, people can give you all of this this run around. You know, it's like there's no one you can scream at. There's because the, because you know you'll get arrested. That's that's assault. That's threatening. You know, it's like it's just ten times worse. And no one tells you how to navigate it. There's no rank structure. There's none of that. It was just difficult for me to, to get used to that. It was just so many people not doing their jobs, and there's no consequence for that whatsoever. I just, I just couldn't get, I couldn't handle it. I still can't. It drives me crazy. Even if I, wa if I walk into Starbucks, you know, and there's 12 people working, and there's three customers, and it's taking too long for my drink. It's like, like I see inefficiencies everywhere, and, I, and it drives me nuts. But now those are jokes. Whereas when before I had comedy, it, it, I would just feel powerless. What do you think is one of the most common misperceptions civilians have about the military? 
Well, for Marine specifically, I think one of the biggest ones is that all of us are uh, are super karate killers that just need a shoestring to kill ten men and that kind of thing, you know. Um, whereas it's, it's not quite that serious. Um, I think a lot of them think that all of us are Republicans, and that's certainly not the case. You know what? I think the biggest one is that a lot of civilians think that all of us want to be thanked for our service. I hate that. I hate it when people thank me for my service. It's it's such an empty. I don't know. It's it's it. I mean, I I I, <clears throat> I don't have a problem with the sentiment behind it. I get I get it, but it's so dismissive. It's like giving a homeless person a quarter, and you think that oh, you've done something. Like that's all that matters, and you don't care anything about my story or my experience. It's like oh, you hope you're missing an arm. Thank you for your service. Like that makes it, you know, like you know, you're you're thanking me for my service is all you need to contribute, you know, for me losing my arm or for me having PTSD or whatever, you know. And it's like don't, I don't know. It's just such an empty phrase. Like it's a blow off kind of. Right, right. It kind of makes me want to ask, what do you think civilians should owe veterans? Just care. Like don't assume. You know, ask. Don't assume that I think like you. Don't assume that I feel like I'm protecting your freedoms or whatever. Like, ask me about myself instead of just assuming that I'm just cut out of your perception of what a Marine or a soldier is. Do you think that being a Marine or a soldier or a veteran makes it difficult? It's like a barrier for a civilian to see you as a person. Like, do you think that it's kind of like what we talked about with career lifestyles? Like, a cop is is often not seen as a person. They're seen as a cop, you know what I mean? Oh, right, right. Like, you're sort of forever separate. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think there's a... But I think that per, that perception is different for every person. But I think, yeah, as soon as they find that fact out about you, you know, they have a thing in their mind that they... They have a, a box in their mind that they will put you in. As soon as they know you're a veteran, they assume all these other things about you. And most of those things aren't true. Well, my last question is, uh, if you were to counter some man or woman in the service about to transition out and you caught them two or three weeks before they did, what advice would you give them? Get on top of your paperwork. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that paperwork. That's how they get you. I mean, that's true in the service, but it's it's a thousand times so outside. Like the VA... I think that's how they weed people out is they'll make you fill out a thousand forms and, and you put in the same information on every form and there it's, it's, it's just this paper wall. You know, they know eventually you'll stop climbing over those walls. That's how they deter you from getting a lot of your benefits. They just put this incredible bureaucracy in your way. If you think the military bureaucracy is huge, you have no idea <laughs> trying to get your money out outside is just incredible. It's easier to get your tax refund than it is to get your military disability. And it's faster, too. The VA is the worst. It's the best and worst thing for veterans. It's a vagina with teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Simpson, thanks for being on Incoming. Thanks for having me. That was my interview with Brian Simpson, but we don't want to leave him there because we can't just talk about him being a killer stand-up comedian without letting you hear some of it for yourself. So here's Brian on stage at Beachwood in San Diego back in March of 2016. Like, as a black person, I'm supposed to be afraid of, uh, of racist cops. But if I'm being honest, I'm way more afraid of racist lifeguards. <laughs> so much more dangerous. Because a, a racist cop has to at least break a sweat, you know? File some false paperwork. A racist lifeguard just has to not notice you out there. And you're dead. So, Jim, uh, you've let about uh, seven black people drown this week. Is it something you want to tell me? <laughs> well, gee, boss, they're hard to see. I, mean, <laughs> I thought it was a baby seal or something. <laughs> 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 
Good job, employee of the month. <laughs> so ask yourselves, is it that black people can't swim? Or have we been the victims of a decades-long conspiracy by the aquatic wing of the Ku Klux Klan? <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I don't help people with their missing pets. All right, that's just my personal policy. <laughs> when I see a lost dog sign, to me, that's just one side of the story. <laughs> I mean, you say your dog is lost, but he could have just escaped from your fucked up house. <laughs> Like, these people, they want you to believe that their dog's biggest problem is that he can't find them. He's lost. And I used to think that was true, but then I saw this episode of Mythbusters. And they were testing the strength of dog noses, and they let this guy hide in the woods for two hours. And they gave this dog one sniff of his underwear. Dog found him in 15 minutes. <laughs> wasn't even his dog. <laughs> so the next time I saw one of those signs, I thought to myself, well, maybe your dog knows exactly where you are. <laughs> you just can't handle the fact that he chose the streets. <laughs> And as, as a black man, I'm not entirely comfortable returning the runaway to its master, so. <laughs> That's right. All my jokes are about slavery. Buckle up. Buckle up. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Marine Corps veteran Dan Lopez is going to tell you a true story about smoking pot with the Taliban. But first, I have to tell you a story about Dan Lopez. When I tell stories about Dan to civilians, I shorthand introduce him as my junkyard dog. Another of our Marine friends describes Dan as enlisted as f or every officer's worst nightmare. Dan has an opinion about pretty much everything, but it's never from the angle I expect him to come at it from. Like for instance, why he thinks America has the best warriors in the world. You get a corn-fed Nebraska boy breeding with a Samoan, holy cow, and you put that guy in seal pattern? Oh, I got bounce a ball on his nose and sit there and, oh, get out of here, man. He's crass, boundaryless when sober, even more so when drinking, and ingeniously foul-mouthed, which made it really fun for me when it came time to edit his interview for public radio. Motherfucker, we're warriors, man. I don't give a god what anybody says. We're all f***ed up. F*** you. We're f***ing warriors, man. The shit that we did... Nobody could do that, shit. man. Like, we lost a lot of motherfuckers doing this, shit, man. But we're fucking doing some ninja, shit, bro. We're doing some fucking straight up ninja, shit. man. All of us to wear that fucking get one, man. I'm telling you, dude. All of us were getting it like that. And if he thinks he's surrounded at a gathering by a certain kind of company, like for instance, white people who listen to NPR, he really plays up his rough around the edges persona his run-ins with the law and time spent in jail, his body count while he was serving overseas. But the people who know him know the marshmallow that lives underneath all that. Still, he's somebody I genuinely worry about, a lot. But he's also someone I think might outlive us all. He's a person who'd roll out of bed at three in the morning if he needed his help, and he wouldn't stop to ask any questions on the way. Anyone who's ever been a part of a tribe and had to leave it knows how rare a quality that is. And when you find it, Sometimes you look the other way when they get themselves into trouble. I like it here better than I like it back home because everybody's about me, 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 me. And then, like, these people here, I mean, at least with the guys I'm with, it's about us. It's a brotherhood, man. It's about us. But that is not why I'm friends with Dan. It's because through all of his uncompromising loyalties to the Marine Corps, to his country, deeper than all of that, 
Dan is a man who stands up for the underdog. He finds the humanity in people and meets them where they're at. Like hearts and minds, but actually believed and lived. Marines will do more for less and with less forever for the rest of our lives. I tried to get Dan to write this story out for us, but he's a busy guy. So I thought I'd just invite him over to my home studio. and We could talk it out together and I'd edit it up in post. We made a date. I called him on the afternoon of the day of to let him know I'd be home in about five minutes and he could show up anytime, whenever, after that. And he said he was already smoking a joint, sitting in my backyard with his pit bull. But she's a gentle baby and that my cat was okay. That is Dan Lopez. So anyway, here we go. I'm getting roughed up like a man since I was six. Grew up uh, in northeastern Colorado. Parts where nobody talks about Colorado. The plains, we grew up on a ranch, farming and ranching. We had cattle, we had horses, we had, I mean, I graduated 13 kids in my senior class. I mean, it connects into this whole story. It's just the kind of lifestyle I grew up in. And it was just like very relatable about what we're about to talk about. My uncle was a Vietnam vet. He was with 1-1 one, one Delta Company, man. He said they called us Dying Delta. I always looked at him like the manliest man. Cause my dad, he, he was never around, so I grew up just outside of jail. <laughs> Either in social services, foster care, got emancipated, got back, and then went, stayed with my mom for a little bit. Got in a car wreck right after I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Dislocated my hip, jacked up my leg pretty good. So that disqualified me for two years. After I got out of that, foster care dropped me, and then I was just like, oh man, what am I gonna do? I was like reaching out to my recruiters, hey, you still want to get in? I said, yeah, and he goes, they're taking dudes with pins in their leg because that's when Iraq was just, but that's when Bush was doing that surge, man. And I had just gotten a DUI and I had gotten so many minor possessions or whatever the hell it was. Next thing you know, we're in Iraq and we're doing doing the first pump, doing the, the second battle flus of Phantom Fury, man. And then, Haditha happened. We all know what happened to Haditha. That rock and roll show happened. Lost my closest friend there. After that, guys got out. Guys lost it. Guys took their lives. Guys overdosed. We all shotgunned everywhere, man. I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a time out. Got married and had a kid. Kind of took in my other son. You know, I got two boys. You know, I, got, I got three boys now. Iraq was a bitter, bitter beast for me, man. But I loved my job. I was a squad leader, man. Infantry squad leader, dude. How much more could you ask for? What'd you like about it? Oh my God. I, it's your guys. When you're away from everybody, you could run it how you want it and you can build the leadership how you want it. And you could filter all that stuff from, from higher ups and you could take care of your guys the best you could. They know that you're going to have their back no matter what. If you're going to go to bat for them like this, they got to know you're going to have them there. Taking care of them, you know, they're yours, you know? And I, I just grew up with such a variety of people. I mean, I, I was a knucklehead growing up too, so it was easy for me to even relate to these cats. And there's so many guys that would just snitch on their guys. It's like, why would you do that, man? Keep it at your level. If it becomes a problem, if you warn this guy enough, he doesn't want to listen to you, and it's going to cause problems for you, then it's a problem. Take care of it that way. But in the meantime, if you can't handle your boy then, man, you don't deserve the position. So after Iraq, you become an instructor at the School of Infantry for how long? A year and a half, two years almost. And then somebody said, well, if you don't extend to re-enlist, you're going to go straight to Afghanistan with 2-1. And I was like, well, <laughs> guess who's going to wait out your little gun show, man? So next thing you know, I'm getting sent over to 2-1. Yeah, so tell me about the deployment to Afghanistan. Oh. Like, where was your first like landing? It was. Uh, we went to Helmand Province. It was in the winter, so it was kind of cool. There wasn't a lot going on, you know? A lot of stuff was blasting off down south, though. I mean, it's wild, wild west. These guys fight the Russians, you know what I mean? I have a lot of respect for the Afghani people in general, man. There are some places in Afghanistan that have never been conquered by anyone. It is just insane, the strength that these people have. It's respectable, man. You gotta respect that true-blooded warriors there, man. You got the Kuchi tribe. They're, they're traveling. They're in the desert people. Crazy, man. Camels, man. 
still like biblical style people, man. They live in these dome tents made out of camel skins and they just travel north to south through the desert. I saw these people, we hung out and I drank some goat wine. It messed me up, it made me sick and holy cow. And I drank it again because it made me feel so crazy. It was great, man. I was having a blast out there, man. Everybody was like, careful what you're eating. I'm like, I eat everything, sir. I don't, they're like, you're gonna eat something, they're gonna poison you. I'm like, well, if they're gonna poison me, they're gonna do it. I haven't found anything to kill me yet. Let's see, party on, man. If it's gonna be poison, it's gonna be some hard drug that's gonna just send me for a trip. Threaten me with a good time, you know what I mean? Would you poison everybody you meet? God, would you just treat somebody like they're a human being? And it makes me sick. What's your like patrol route or your uh, your mission when you're in Afghanistan? We're holding, we're just holding this land. This is already taking ground. There's a lot of IED problems there. Guys are getting blown up left and right. Um, the Holly stick was created there. It was named a Gunner Sergeant Holly. <laughs> Longest bamboo stick you could find with this little sickle. You know what I mean? That, that we used and we 550 corded, duct taped it, whatever. And that was our IED finding tool. The first patrol base that I get was called Warwick. It was just named after the village it was next to. And I made friends with everybody over there. Good friends. We're playing volleyball with those cats over there, man. We're having such a good time. Posted security, and I was like, you mind if we just watch you guys play ball, man? They're like, no, go ahead. And after a while, it'd be us against them. It was good. It was community, man. It's like, hey, I'm not those guys. And they're like, we know. I started asking my wife at the time. I was like, hey, can you get me a volleyball net? I need another volleyball. They stretched it out, looked awesome. Later on, some other kids stole it from another village. I went and patrolled over there. Hey, give me a volleyball net back. And the where I was at was exactly the kind of place that I grew up in, man. Farmland, guys just trying to just scrape in their backs, making a dollar. Granted, it's off a of pot and opium. Hey, that's their crop. It's how they're making money. That stuff grows in sand. Hey, they, they told us to go there and chop down their fields and tell them to, if they want to grow something to go get wheat, really. Really, dude. Go get wheat, deliver this stuff to them. You want us to chop it down, man? Let them harvest this stuff, and then when they go get their new seed, oh, man, it made me mad. So I was going around and telling dudes, it's like, hey, you guys can't have it outside, all right? Harvest what you can right now. Just harvest what you can. I'm not going to chop it down. If you guys got a little dumb thing, I'll stomp on some stuff just to feed the bear if I got some kind of commander with me, but I'll patrol him away from all the fields because I knew where everything was at. And they were telling me I wasn't patrolling my AO because they kept on finding all the poppy and all the... Let them make a buck, man. They're poor, man. They, they need to make some money. There's so much pot out there, so much pot, that you couldn't come back from a patrol without the stuff being in your dump pots. If you're a gunfighter, you know what a dump pot is. It's where you toss your empty mags because you, it's not like in the movies you just throw mags on the ground. You got to keep that stuff because later on you're going to get another gunfight and you got to reload those things. Those things don't just fall from the sky or whatever. But you couldn't come back from a patrol without having buds in your dump pouch, man. And I was like, shoot, I got papers. I got spliffs. I got buds. Come on, let's see what Afghanistan's all about. I grew up in Colorado, man. We smoke weed got sent over to this other spot called Kojibad. I shouldn't be saying these names, probably gonna get my head chopped off. It was a good village, man. But these dudes, dude, man, there was a doctor, a dentist, a shopkeeper, and this sneaky schmoozy dude, you know, always in the back. Cool cat, but he never said much, you know what I mean? After every patrol, I'd always like, hey guys, let's stop by the shop, let's see if they got anything you guys want. And I'd sit down, we'd just smoke cigarettes, and I'd have my interpreter there, and we'd all just talk. Some of my guys, hey, I told them, I said, you guys can bring whatever you want. I'm going slick because I want to show them that I trust them. It's a familyhood thing. You know, it's like, this, we're neighbors. They had their AKs. I didn't give a damn. Got a gun. I got a gun. Hey, <laughs> boy, outlaws, brother. What's up? <laughs> and the old man started talking to me about when he fought the Russians, man. And it was so much like when I was talking to my uncle, dude. He was talking about stories fighting the Russians. He showed me some bullet holes. He had three crazy bullet holes down the side of him. And I was like, oh my gosh, man. All those guys were his sons. There's the shop owner, the doctor, the teacher, the dentist, and the other cat was Taliban, man. After a while, that guy that always started hanging out in the back started speaking up. I remember there's one time he goes, why are you here? And I was like, I'm here for a job, man. I'm getting paid to do this. 
I wanted to do something for my country. Military was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a fighter. Because I knew exactly who he was. Growing up, man, I've seen enough dudes that love who they are and just don't care. Hard-hitting dudes, man. I've seen some meat grinders growing up, man. I knew he was one, man. I could just tell. Just the way, his demeanor, the way he just hung back and just read everybody. He just read my man card, basically. You know? Do you think he read in you what you read in him? Like, yeah, you, you know, we you talked recognized about it. Him. Yeah. We talked about How'd it. How'd it go? It was pretty good. I was like, hey, man, tell us, tell us what you know. I know you know something. What's up, dude? I kept on hassling. I knew who he was. It was like, you know who we're looking for. You know some of these guys. We came across a couple of them. We got pictures of these guys. I'm tired of just giving you guys contracts. I'm hooking up your villages. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm not going to mess with you guys. I'm not going to do some dirty stuff. I'm not going to tear your stuff apart. I'm here to help you out, man. Be open with me. He goes, some of these guys are my friends. Some of these are, are farmers. He goes, we're all just here living here. Yeah, I made my living off of poppy and pot. Yeah. Yeah, this is me. Yeah, this is my palace. In the middle of nowhere. What do you expect me to do? He said, I don't expect you to do anything different, man. I know exactly what you're talking about, man. I get it, dude. Don't blow us up. That's all I'm asking. Don't blow us up, dude. Stop killing Marines. He goes, then what's wrong with them over there? Talking about the other squads. I was like, what are they doing? And he goes, go over there. Go over there. And I was like, all right, cool, screw it. And I think that was kind of his like, what kind of man are you? Are you going to listen to me? Or are you just going to sit there and just tell me I'm some dumb Afghani? Dumb, some sheep hump or whatever. You know what I mean? Some kind of stupid, ignorant thing that, that they always hear. We got back from that patrol, and one of my team leaders, he goes, Sergeant, I don't know which way that was going to go. He goes, I felt we were going really close. I was like, hey, man, that's why I had you guys there, man. I'm not going to go solo. And I said, if the stuff would have popped off, we would have killed them all. I patrol over to this other spot, man. And I'm like, hey, can I just kind of scramble around? I just want to go for a walk. I want to check out all the AO. I'm hearing all these great things. I'm hearing about these elders over here that have great food. And I'm seeing how these guys are going. I'm looking at these locals and like, everybody's going inside their houses. It's like, what the hell is going on in here, man? What are these guys doing? When I'm patrolling around my neighborhoods, they're coming out and they're grabbing me by my arm and pulling me in the house so we can have chai, eat candy. We can talk about ditches. We can talk about building bridges across the canals and stuff. These other squads were going under wrecking houses, putting cigarettes out on dudes, kicking them around, Ripping families apart right in front of the kids. It's like, what are you doing, man? Have some respect. Don't zip tie the dude in front of his family, in front of his kids. Oh my God, it's, it's ridiculous, man. No wonder why they hate us. It hurt me because it's like, I know there was good dudes in those squads getting messed with. One dude, he's messed up. 19 years old, man. 19 years old. Just got hit with the roadside IED. Roadside bomb just knocked this kid. Knocked him out cold. Come back. Shaken. Just saw somebody get blown up in front of him. Called in a hit that just happened on his squad to make sure everybody else is okay. He didn't know what happened. He just know he got hit and he knew there was a guy dead in front of him. He got on the hook. 19 years old, man. Got on the hook and did that. Nobody thinks about this stuff, man. And then you got poor leadership in front of him dragging these Solid kids, man. Smart kids. Through hellacious thornstorms like that, man. And it's just like, what are you doing, man? Take care of them. Can you bring them through this stuff? Imagine what they can become, man. You imagine that? And they're just dragging. It's like, you're just a dumb boot. It's like, oh my God, I'll kill you right now. I'll, I'll do the job for them, man. No, dude, if you're going, I'm not going to be the one talking to your mom. If you get blown up, I'm getting blown up with you, man. I'm not, oh, hell no. No, I'll let somebody else box us both up and pick up our pieces. So after you went up to the other AO and you kind of see what this dude was talking about in terms of like the disrespect, did you get to have another conversation with him after that? We had a lot of conversations after that, man. We became boys, man. We understood we're enemies. We don't want to fight each other. We would wreck each other's lives. 
more likely we would destroy each other's families before we destroy each other because that's how we fight. He would attack my squad. He would let me watch my guys get shredded. I'd make him watch me destroy his villages. We knew what each other were capable of. We knew it. We respected that. A whole little thing was starting to blossom, dude. I'm not going to say his name. He's on a, he's on a HBI list. And after a while, I was hanging out at his brother's shop, and he came in over there. It was one of those times where I was patrolling, and I just told my guys to go ahead. He brought up the hookah. Threw on some herb, man. And I was like, because we started asking. He was like, do you guys smoke any of this stuff? And they're like, no, we don't do any of it. And I was like, oh, there's no way. How come I keep on rolling up on you guys around the corners, like sneaking this stuff in your, like, dude's high, just high. I feel like all my guys came back because I smoked pot with the Taliban, man. It was just, it was there, dude. I mean, it was there, man. And when we got back from patrol, we kind of debriefing. I said, boys, I don't think we got to worry about anything. I think we're good. Every single one of my guys came back without a scratch, man. Every single one of them, dude. I love my boys, man. I got three kids, man. Every single guy I ever had under my command, I've always tried to treat him like a son of my own. Nobody's going to understand that, man. Ever. That's our show with Dan Lopez and Brian Simpson. I love them both like brothers. So this was a very personal subject matter for me, if you couldn't tell. Everybody in the armed forces is a personal subject matter to someone. The family and friends who knew who they were before they put on the uniform and who have to reacquaint themselves when they come home. Maybe if we did a better job remembering that as a society, we could do a better job getting funding to the programs veterans need. Incoming is produced by myself, Justin Hudnell. Jennifer Pepperpot Corley is our editor and sound designer. At KPBS, Kurt Conan is our audio engineer. Lisa Morissette Zapp is operations manager. Nate John is our intimidatingly youthful innovation specialist. And John Decker is program director. Music for Dan Lopez's story was Absent Minded by Rescue Sleeping Giants. Support for Incoming comes from the KPBS Explorer program the California Arts Council Veterans Initiative in the Arts, Cal Humanities, and supporting members of So Say We All. Learn more about us at our website at www.sosayweallonline.com, and we'd love it if you drop us a line via email, share your thoughts, tell us some stories at info at Thanks for listening. We'll talk again soon.